Got no control. Graffiti podcast for all graffiti writers. Before we start today, I want to give a special shout out to my very first sponsor, Made Fresh Graffiti Shop, which is located in Dominguez, California, inside of Delamo Indoor. Make sure to follow them on Instagram. Check them out. All the supplies you need. And they also offer airbrush services and supplies. With that being said, I got a very special guest in the building today, Carmelo Alvarez. How are you doing today? Good, good. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, man, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for, you know, taking the drive down here and blessing us with your time. My pleasure, man. So for those, I want to jump right into it. For those who don't understand or don't even know what Radiotron is, brother, can you explain and shed a little bit of light on that? Uh, Radiotron, I'll give a little bit of the backstory of Radiotron. Okay. Uh, 1983, I was building a performing arts school for the community, for the youth, and the owner of a building where I rented an office yeah. um, told me, hey, I have, a, I have a little building in the back. It has a stage. So when I heard the word stage, <laughs> <laughs> in my weak spot, you know, Yeah. because my background is in, is in theater. I actually started as a tap dancer okay. when I was 15 years old. And uh, I met uh, another young, another teenager named Chester Whitmore. Okay. And Chester said, hey, you want to be in my tap troupe? So at the time, I was, um, I was uh, running with the gang, you know. I was uh, stealing cars, actually. Okay. And, um, and the gang was in Los Angeles? Yeah. Los Angeles? You know, I, and uh, I, was, I was, you know, I was doing things, uh, running around the streets. And when Chester said, you want to be in my tap troupe? I was like... Gang bang, tap dance. <laughs> Gang bang, tap dance. Big difference. And I chose tap dance, and it transformed my life. Okay. So shout out to Chester Whitmore, my brother. I've known him for over 50 years, and we still, we're still we still friends forever. Uh, I, get, I, even, I get emotional, you know, because, um, because he, I don't know what he saw in me, because he just saw me and said, uh, you want to be in my tap troupe? Sometimes it just takes somebody inviting you yeah. to be a part of something. That can transform your life. But the fact that I was open to it. Okay. See, I was open to it. So I said, okay, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll check it out. So he invited me to Inner City Cultural Center that was in my neighborhood. It was uh, it was on Pico off of Vermont, Pico in New Hampshire. Okay. And there he introduced me to Faye Nicholas of the Nicholas Brothers. Oh. Now, now at the time, I didn't know who, I didn't know who Faye Nicholas was. <laughs> but I found out that I was amongst... Greatness. Uh, the Nicholas Brothers were the first African American tap dance duo to appear in, uh, like in, in Hollywood musicals. And how did that make you feel being around greatness? Well, I was humble. Okay. I was humble because um, the fact that they took me under the wing and showed me the moves, and and this is what I got when I did the shows, <laughs> and I never got that. Okay. What I always got was, you're not good for nothing. Get out of here. Yeah. You know? That's what I always got. Or you're, 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 I was always in trouble because I was always bullied, you know, for being short. Okay. And, and I just had a little chip on my shoulder because I used to take down bullies and it's a beat up. Bully. So then <laughs> I was like the entertainment for recess. Hey, go call him a shrimp and see what he does. <laughs> so, so when they come over there, you know, I'd let see, him have the, it. The fact that, I had good coordination because my dad did teach me to box. Okay. So it made sense that, okay, I had coordination for tap dancing. Okay. Boxing and tap dancing and, and sports in general is very similar, you know. Uh, There's actually some professional boxers that have done the tap dancing prior to their boxing Well, there are a lot of, some of them career. still, they, they, they dance a lot. They dance around a lot. <laughs> you know to, to you got to move. You got to be able to move, right? To fix a footwork. Right. You got to get the fo fancy footwork. So, so that changed my life. And I say that backstory is important because I want people to understand what my motivation was for wanting to open a performing arts academy or a performing arts center in the MacArthur Park area. Okay. Because at the time, uh, there was a movie called Fame that came out. But that was like New York, right? Okay. But we didn't have that. Like yeah. when, I, when I went to Inner City, it was rare to find a, a, a theater, a performing arts center in our community. I mean, even still today. Yeah, because where, where, where I, are they? I can't name. I can't even name you one, brother. To be honest with exactly. you. Exactly. So in East LA, there used to be like 250 theaters. Now there's only like one. 
you know, one, just one. And for anybody out there that's listening, we're not talking about like an AMC theater or a, or a Cinemark theater. We're talking about a theater where they will perform live. Well, like, for example, on Broadway, like on, on Broadway, yeah. that was the Broadway West. Yeah. So all those theaters were built for live shows. Mm -hmm. And now they're closed, you know. There is a movement to, to revive them, to open them. So when I talk to the city about it, they're like, no, right now we're dealing with the homeless. And I'm like, this is a solution because through culture... It's what generates commerce. Yes, Culture definitely. is the number one generator of the economy in Los Angeles and in big cities like around the world. Yeah. People come to L.A. for the culture. People go to New York for the culture. People go to France for the culture. People go to around the world. They travel. They want to go. They go there for the culture. They don't go there for the hotel. They don't go there to stay in a hotel. Yeah, or they like, like to you, fly on a plane. It's like when you see people like from other parts of the world come to California, Los Angeles, just to... Be around the culture, like right now, like the low writing, the low writers, you know, the Chicano mm -hmm. culture, the hip hop culture. And it's crazy how they adapt to it and they take it back home. Yeah. So, so the thing is that my question is, where does the culture come from? Yeah. So in 1983, a gentleman gave me the opportunity and I was, t I was sharing with you earlier that um, it was a miracle when people say, how did you do it? It's a miracle because the man didn't ask me for first and last or credit check. Okay. You know, he said, okay, here's the, here's the keys to a building with the stage. And then he says, yeah, but um, only one thing. Uh, Friday nights, 11 to like 5 in the morning, there's a club there. He goes, tell them they got to go. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, well, let me check it out, right? Go do my dirty work. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know. So I went there and uh, it was a club called Radio. Okay. And I walked in, and it's crazy because uh, I don't know if can you curse on, yeah, on yeah, your yeah. podcast? Yeah. Okay, so right when I walked, right when I walked up, getting ready to walk in, somebody threw a bottle at me and they yelled out "fucking Mexican." Oh wow! Yeah, that was a tough crowd. It, it was coming from somewhere across the street, you know. So I was like, "Wow, somebody doesn't want me here." Yeah. But then right after that, I heard somebody yell out, "Hey, Madonna, Madonna's coming!" So I saw a white limo, you know, and I. So Madonna getting out and she walked right up, right up in there and I'm like, that's weird, right? Yeah. Like, what's going on here? You know? Yeah, so, like, so what you guys got going on in there? What's man? going on in there? So I walked in, <laughs> and the first thing I see is Ice T rapping. And he's calling the 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 moves like there's a break, there's a break battle going on. And Ice T was like um by moves and be like, hey, has been like that. No, or? no, it's like uh, we got uh, you know, Shake City in the house, you know, busting the the, the the head spins and he was <laughs> oh okay okay yeah he was he was uh, uh like a hype man freestyle for freestyle okay. freestyle you know freestyle rapping uh calling this calling the moves as they as as, as he saw it you know dope and and giving the shout outs and it was like a call and response it was it was like an energy okay that that reminded me of um of earlier earlier cultural movements like like the bebop movement of the 1930s jazz you know yeah. which was like an underground right and then in the 1950s, you had the uh, the beatniks, the, the beat movement, you know, where they were like guys with uh, like glasses like yours with turtlenecks. Yeah. And it would be like, who, daddy? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they called, them, they called each other cat. Okay. You know, now they, now they call each other dog. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah. went from cat to dog, right? Yeah. So, so now the kids in the 80s, they were like, that's fresh instead of that's cool. Okay. Or like, let's chill, you know? Yeah. But it was the same thing as far as Every 10 years, there's a new cultural movement, whether it's the bebop, the beatniks, and then the hippies, and then the hip hop. So I, I saw I, I saw it so clear. Like, I saw it so clear. I go, this is the new. Yeah. And this was in 83. So it was the beginning of the decade, even though, even though. And you noticed this by walking into the radio club? Yeah. Okay. Because you got to consider that I started tap dancing in the 70s. Okay. So Chester got me hip to, see, when we say the word hip, yeah. that means gave me the knowledge. Okay. Enlightened me. Yeah. Okay. Got me hip to the history of 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 Africans coming to America from the slave ships to to when they were slaves and they did the musical the the spirituals uh, to the minstrel shows to the swing era like the whole history of the contribution of African Americans to the culture okay. in America. So I was already hip to that. Yeah. And and by and and by me being embraced, right? Yeah. By that community, my first musical was 
a show called Crenshaw Boulevard. And I was like a token Mexican in a black musical. Right here in Los Angeles? Right here in LA, in the Inner City okay. Cultural Center. Okay. But the beautiful thing is that they embraced me. They embraced me. And that's why I can't, even though somebody could yell at me, you fucking Mexican, and they could be African American, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to return anything back to them. I respect to you for, you for not going that because, route. Because, like, you know, there's a lot of controversy going on right now, and I want to speak on that. That, uh, that you know, um, when somebody saves your life, yeah, right? Um, you know, I've been, I've been jumped. I've been jumped by African Americans. I've been jumped by my own people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've been jumped. Yeah. In fact, uh, one time I got jumped by some by some some cholos, right? Because they said, "You think you're all good, eh?" I go, "What? You're jumping me because you think I think I'm all good? <laughs> like, what? you want me to have low self esteem or you be all me, sad in the corner? You want me to hate myself? <laughs> I was feeling I was feeling good about. I was at a quinceanera, you know. I'm feeling yeah. good about myself, right? Yeah. And they go, "No, you think you're all good, eh?" And they jump me for that. Wow. And then one time, you know, my 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 mother um. She fought, she was fighting with my dad because I wanted a mini bike. Right? Yeah. I wanted a mini bike. And my dad, no, we can't afford that. So then at Christmas, I got a mini bike. You know, I was like, <laughs> well, I got a mini bike. So I drove it to the park. Yeah. And there was this kid there, African American kid. And he's like, hey, can I ride your, your mini bike? I go, yeah, but just around here. Okay. And then he got on it and he drove away. And when, <laughs> when, when it came to Radio Tron, which at that moment was Radio Club, how did you maneuver yourself through that tension? Okay, so what happened was that um, when I got the uh, see since I had already since I already started when I was fifteen in tap dancing, yeah, and then I had already toured as a ragtime dancer, and then I had already opened uh, a theater in, on Pico and Hoover, and then I had already gone to New York and I ran a coffee house showcase. So when I came there, it wasn't like my first little rodeo, you yeah, know. Yeah. I already had a history of creating space. Okay. Okay. So. I knew the value of, of a building with a hardwood floor and a stage. I knew the value. Yeah, definitely. In fact, I had Chester come and practice in there. <laughs> I know? come by some move real quick. I you know. I knew the value of it, right? Yeah. But I, what I didn't expect was that I was going to get a knock on the door and it was going to be Canon Film saying, we want to make the movie Breaking here. Definitely. Okay, so at that time, uh, when the owner gave me the building and I told uh, the promoter, the owner of Radio Club, yeah. which was a Russian guy. I said, hey, you guys could stay. And he said, no, no, you don't know who we are. Uh, he stormed out, you know, all mad. Yeah. And I don't know why he was mad, you know. See, the thing is, if people don't take the time to talk to each other, we don't know that it's all good. See, if he took the time to just sit with me and talk to me instead of uh, thinking negative, negatively about me, or if people say, hey, you fucking Mexican, without taking the time to sit and talk to me, yeah. They're going to find out, I got love for you. <laughs> I'm grateful to you, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You 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 transformed my life. Definitely. You know? And culture does that. Culture is the best of a people. A conversation will go a long way. Yeah. Culture is the best of a people. That which you want to pass on to your children and your children's children. The values, the morals. That's culture. Yeah, definitely. So, so when, uh, when they come and knocking on my door, I literally had $5 in my pocket. Like I was... But I still have faith. You see, that's the that's the recurring theme in my life. Yeah. See, because when the owner gave me the building, mm -hmm. I said, um, God, you know, you want me to have the keys to that building? But you know why? And you know why? You know why? You know why God gave me the keys to that building? Because he had a purpose for you? Yes. And you know what the keys are for? To open doors. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> that's it, man. So... So I'm standing there with five bucks, in, five bucks in my pocket. How many flyers can I make? Flyers for to bring in the kids. Oh, like to promote I, the, the. I was gonna start teaching them tap and whatever I knew, theater. You okay. know, teaching them what I knew. So right? you're just a man with an idea ready to open doors. Yeah. Um. Exactly. Yeah. I got a space. I got five bucks. How many flyers can I make? <laughs> Let's get this going. Let's get this going. I can teach them tap. I can teach theater. I can teach. You know, we can do music. We can do whatever. Whatever they bring. And then just on a random day, they just and then came. Knock on the door. Hey, hey, we're trying to make the movie break in here. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then they came in and they and here comes Poglu Shrimp, here comes Ice T, here comes Shabadoo, here comes the whole crew, you know. Yeah. So they're making the movie break in there. And that's where Craze came in. Because this is a show about graffiti. 
Shout so out let's, craze. let's shout out to craze. Let's clarify that craze and graph one. Okay. Okay. Let's clarify that for, for once and for all. All right. Let's now, clarify. Now the thing was I was telling you, right? When when uh, when somebody says, "Oh well, I heard," well, that's hearsay. Yeah. But when you get it from the source, that's first source. So I was there. Definitely. Okay, so I was there. I'm a witness. I'm a first source eyewitness to what happened. So Craze and Graph One were were hired by Canon Films to paint Radio Club on the stage. Yeah. But then the promoter of Radio Club comes in and goes, no, I didn't give him permission to do that. You got to pay me to use my name. Exactly. So then the producer calls the Radiotron. Now, our phone at the Radiotron was a pay phone. See, we, I didn't have, like, I have five bucks. Yeah. So, but we, luckily, there was a pay phone. Right in front? In the lobby. No, in oh, the lobby. Inside oh, wow. the lobby, it was a pay phone, right? Yeah. Luckily, so I used that phone on my card and everything. Yeah. <laughs> that was the phone, right? The admin phone, right? So I get a call from the producer. Hey, can I talk to the graffiti artist? I go, sure. Hey, they want you on the phone. This so, was crazy. So Craze comes on the phone, and I just say, uh-huh, uh-huh. He hangs up. They, Craze goes over and buffs out club. Yeah. And writes Tron. And is that the famous picture that we see today with the heart? Yes. Now, if you look, if you look closely, like if you get a mic, like a like a magnifying glass, yeah, you could see a little gray around Tron because they buffed Club and they wrote Tron. So I give credit, and 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 where credit is due, and that was Craze and Graph One were talking. What about Tron? <laughs> like they were like clowning because yeah. I think the movie Tron had come out, right? Yeah. So then they were like clowning, and then. And you get it, you're gonna get it straight from Craze. Yeah. See, you, when you have him on your show, he'll tell you the straight, you know? Okay. But I saw it. I saw him buffing and I saw Ring Tron. So that's how Radio Tron was born. Okay. So then the name itself. The name itself. Okay. Then after they filmed, I they they brought buckets of gray paint. Yeah. And they were gonna remove all the graffiti that oh, they they're gonna buff it. Yeah, they were going to buff it. Like all the graffiti they painted for the movie, they were going to take it out. Oh, wow. I said, no. <laughs> Leave because, that up there for me. Of course, because I'm, okay, think about it. I'm there by myself and I'm in a building and it needs color. You know, it needs color. I mean, we need color. Life In life, we need color. Bro. Definitely. It, it, it uplifted the building. I can't see a black and white TV all day. I'm saying that it uplifted, <laughs> it uplifted the building, yeah. you know? So I go, no, no, leave it alone. It looks good. Okay. Then they left. Then here's another knock. So there's a lot of a lot of doors in my life, a lot of keys, a lot of knocks on the door. Yeah. So, so and then there's another knock. I open the door. A little kid. Hey, mister, can we break in there? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And at this point, did you know what break was? Okay, I did because when before I I was in New York for three years. Okay. So the first time I saw break dancing was 1980 on Fifth Avenue. There were kids. Cardboard box, boom box, they were breaking for money on Fifth Avenue. Oh, so you've seen that at the mother oh, where it I came seen from. I've seen it in New York, yeah, yeah, on Fifth Avenue. Okay. So so when the kids said, Mr., can we break in there? Mm -hmm. I'm like, sure. The kid's name was Gizmo, B-Boy Gizmo. So okay. shout out to B-Boy Gizmo. <laughs> shout out B-Boy Gizmo. And, uh, and then he turns around and goes, hey, the man said we could break in there. <laughs> so the word got out. We could break in there, right? Come on, come on. Yeah, come on, you know. So then they're, the next thing, they're all breaking in there, right? But, but I didn't have music, right? They were just breaking in there. I, and, and this particular moment, bro, how important was it for a, a, a child to have a place to go and do something like break dancing and paint graffiti? Was it something that was very special because it was not looked right on in the street? Yeah, okay, so what, what the, the first crew that came in with Gizmo yeah. was the Hungry Breakers. Okay. And they would break for money for food on the corner of 7th and Alvarado. Okay. So when I let them come in there, you know, they felt like it's a magical place because they, when they were filming the movie, yeah, they were hanging out. Oh, so they were watching. They were watching from the outside. Okay. Now they're in the inside. So, so every kid that went in there, yeah, and this is like also part of hip hop, yeah. Uh, they create their own um, alter ego. So, so like, like that's Gizmo. I don't know if your real name is <laughs> Gizmo. So they become the the. The character that they create for yeah. themselves, like Boogaloo Shrimp, you know, that's my, Michael Chambers, right? But he's Boogaloo Shrimp, right? You go there looking for him with his real name and you then nobody knows who uh, the hell he yeah, is. Yeah, like some of them. <laughs> hey, I'm looking for a, a Ron. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? So so then when they come in there, they were allowed. The, the, I created the space yeah. for them to be that. Okay. You know? 
And it was a magical space, you know, because theater is magic. Like, you could create anything. Like, I don't even need a set, bro. I don't need costumes. I don't need a set. I can create magic, storytelling, right? Okay. So when they came in, um, we didn't have music. So there was this Native American guy who was a security guard. Okay. And the kids called him Psycho. Psycho. Yeah. He, he was, I don't know what the politically correct term is today where he's a little bit mentally challenged. Okay. But he had a heart of gold and he had a boom box. So he come up in there and he's like, Mr. Do you need a security guard? And I looked at his boom box, right? And I go, well, if you let me use your boom box, you could be my security guard, you know? He goes, <laughs> okay. So he put the boom box on the stage and that was our music. So now we had the beep. B boys breaking. We got our boom box, and I got my security guard. Because back then there was no, nice. there, there, there was no Bluetooth speakers. <laughs> no, no. There was no iPad or iPod. But, but, but you see how none of that. But you see how God works, right? Yeah. You see how God works. That's so. Anybody could say anything they want, but it was a divine intervention because you said my purpose. See, I knew my purpose was to use my gifts and my talents to serve the youth, and. And I knew I was going to do it through culture. That's why I'm a youth and culture advocate. Okay. Because culture changed my life, you know? And not only culture of art and music, but the culture of treating others with respect and with love. See? By me opening the doors to them where they're getting tickets on the street corner for breakdancing in the street. Yeah. Graffiti writers, their parents are like, Stop that scribbling. You go get a real job and throwing their markers away and Quítame esas chingaderas yeah, aquí. <laughs> tearing up their, 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 their sketches and saying it's, it's garbage. And then the rappers, they're saying, no, that's not music. That's not real music. That's gibberish. <clears throat> so this is what, so, so I'm a youth and, and culture advocate, but I'm a youth and culture advocate for the misfits, for the rebellious, for the, you know, for those kids. Yeah, yeah. That's who, because that's who I, that's who I was. And what year was this when the gizmos and the psych and psych 1983. Were? 1983. 1983. So from, from 1983, when, when you allowed them to break in there and do their thing, mm -hmm. at what point did the graffiti come in? Okay, perfect. So so then um, uh, the graffiti writers came in, right? And they saw the graffiti. And oh, they came in by themselves? Yeah, they okay. came in and they're like, uh, how can I get my piece up in here, right? It's like, well, let me see a sketch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not letting anything go up on there. <laughs> let me see a sketch, you know? And then... I saw them. Okay, yeah, they were good. I saw the. I saw. I saw it as an art form. I saw it as a new movement. You know, okay. because again, I knew about the revolutionary muralists, Siqueiros, Diego Rivera, Orozco. You know, uh, Siqueiros, David Alfaro Siqueiros, uh, was a revolutionary Mexican muralist that got hired at Chenard Art School in 1930. Okay. And that was across the street from the Radiotron building. Oh, wow. And he painted the first spray mural with the car, with the car uh, spray, paint. spray gun. Yeah. And oh, was, with the car spray gun? Yeah, you know, the, the, with the compressor, the ones that they paint cars oh, with? Oh, okay, okay. That's what he painted, but, he did, but it was a spray, you know? Oh, wow. As a muralist, they used to do brush, you know, fresco and all that, but he used a spray, right? Okay. And his first mural that he did in Los Angeles called the El, El Meeting de los Obreros, the Meeting of the Workers. And it was African and indigenous workers having a meeting to organize a union. Oh wow! So he was already, he was ahead <laughs> he was ahead you know. It was a powerful statement, right? So with all this conflict and black and brown and this, people got to know that Mexico abolished slavery before the United States. Okay. And a lot of Africans went there. Yeah. And to get free to get freedom, but. Also, they also fought in the revolution of Mexico. So we've been helping each other. Yeah, so yeah. let's focus on that part. Um, I'm going to get off the subject. I'm going to make, make a little turn here because it's important as to what's happening right now. Okay. One time Chester called me and he goes, hey, I got a call from John Adams Jr. High that there's like the Mexicans and the blacks, they're having tension. Yeah. So they want me to do a program there. So I go, okay, I'm down. Let's go. You know, so I went there and... Uh, my sister was a folklorico dancer, like she danced uh, Mexican folklorico. Okay. So I brought my sister in and she taught the kids that were black and brown. She taught them folklorico dance and Chester taught them tap. So the kids did a show together. So then after I was asking, what'd you think about it? 
And I was asking African American girls, hey, what do you think about the folklore? Go, oh man, I love the dress, you know, yeah, <laughs> doing yeah. the zapateado and all that. <laughs> you know, and then the and then the other Mexican kids love the tap dancing. Yeah. So so through culture, we made peace in that school for a moment. You know, we brought peace for the moment, and it was me and Chester. But what I didn't realize it was it was how they see us, me and him. Because I never saw Chester as a black guy. I always saw him as my brother, you know? Yeah, yeah. I didn't definitely. think color, I didn't think like that. I didn't think, oh, this black dude. I always definitely. thought Chester. <laughs> yeah. Still today, you know, I think recently I just discovered he's black, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know because <laughs> he made a joke, he made, yeah. a, he made a joke, you know, I produced a show here at uh, Union Station, it was a jazz review okay. with Chester Whitmore and his, and his, and his uh, he has a jazz band, he's a band leader, he's a band leader, he's an amazing filmmaker, I mean, I, I can't stop, you know, th this guy has more ta talent in his little pinky <laughs> than like 99% of Hollywood, you We're know. we Chester. Chester Whitmore. Okay. And did he, have, did he have a contribution to Radiotron? Well, he, he used to go there and, and, and rehearse. Okay. So, so kids got to see other things. But I didn't force them. I didn't, like, I didn't impose on them like what I wanted them to learn. So you didn't give them like a schedule. It was more like, you guys do no. as you please. Well, not as you please now. Okay. <laughs> now, let's hold on. Now. Okay. With art, another word for art is called discipline. It's a, like, what's your discipline? In the art world, uh, when they talk about art, yeah uh what do you practice so the word practice and discipline are very important i give them a space to practice their discipline okay what's your discipline well i'm i'm a dancer a popper pop locker break dancer i'm a writer i'm a artist i'm a graph writer graph artist i'm a dj i'm a rapper those are disciplines yeah okay so here's the thing um the rules that i had were if you're a graffiti artist, yeah, go on, go to the second floor. I gave them a room. They called it the tag room. The tag room because they could tag, they could tag anywhere, but no crossing anybody out and no gang riding. And how big was this room? Um, it was about the size of the office right here. Okay. Like, it was a nice, nice sized office, big, big room. Yeah. You know, with a long table, you know, with the table, chairs around. I got a uh, paper from the offices on Wilshire Boulevard. Yeah. Like stuff that we're going to throw away, like recycled paper. I brought that there, stacks of paper. I went to H.G. Daniels. He gave me markers. Like they would send him samples. Yeah. So he gave me mar markers. I bought an airbrush for them. Okay. And and if they wanted to do a piece at the Radiotron, then we'd get spray cans or they'd bring them. <laughs> like they, had their own, they had their own methods of bringing it, yeah, right? Yeah, So So... Did you ever have an issue where like... For example, let's say a kid will go in there and paint a piece, right? And the, the what you say was called the graph room. No, the tag room. The tag room, sorry. Yeah. And he goes over somebody that was up in there already. Was that ever an issue? No. Okay. The thing was that this is the beauty of it, right? That, and this is again, I, I, you know, when it says like the miracle, right? The miracle. Yeah. We never had a fight. We never had a fight in there. Okay. We never had a fight, and there were guys from different neighborhoods. See, the beauty is that guys from different neighborhoods came. Yeah. And they formed crews. So they could be from different gangs, but they formed one crew. Tagging crews. No, graffiti art crew. Graffiti art crew. To make, to make art. But can you share a little bit about that transition? Like, how was the transition for them being gang members and saying, you know what, we're going to get down with the graffiti and build a graffiti art crew? Because they were always artists, you know, in their heart, they're they're artists. Yeah. But where are the opportunities? See, the, the, the hood will, will say, hey, put up our put up our, our neighborhood. Put up placaso. Yeah, put up our, our placaso, put up our hood, right? Yeah. So these guys would get down with the old English, the block letters, and they would hit up the you know, the roll call. They do the roll call. Yeah, yeah. So they got respect from from the homies, right? Yeah. But when New York hip hop art came out, you know, like the subway art, I mean, people brought pictures. Okay. People brought pictures, you know, and you started seeing, but since I grew up in the 60s, it wasn't, it was not new to me because I grew up with bubble letters, psychedelic art. You know, I saw the influence, you know, yeah. I saw the, the evolution of, of it, of it. All right. So, um, like for example, the wild style. Yeah. Okay. These guys became masters of that. By these guys, you mean the guys inside Radiotron? The guys in Radiotron. Like Deffer, those guys were, they, they were like beyond. I mean, their stuff was. Is there any names you could share with them? Uh, Deffer, um, Prime, Prime, Duke. Uh, K2S members. Re Relic. Okay. Relic. And uh, we also had uh, 
soon and legit came down and they asked me if they could do like the front of Radiotron. Yeah. So the front of Radiotron was like a, a revolving piece, you know? Okay. See, the thing about graffiti art is it doesn't have to last forever. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't have to last forever. It's yeah. it's a, 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 a ephemeral art, you know? Some art, you want to preserve it. If it if it, if it lasts, it lasts. But it ain't a thing, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, they feel. can replace it, you know? This guy soon and the other guy you mentioned, you said they came down. They came down from... They came down and said, hey, can we do a piece in the, at oh, the like Radiotron? Oh, they just showed up to Radio Truck. Yeah, a okay. lot of them would show up. A lot of people would show up to, like just to do a piece. Like Hex, his father was in the union across the street. So he'd come down. I, he, I, what I saw about Hex is that he, he had like a Levi jacket and he put piece in the back of it. Okay. Yeah, so I, that's the first time I saw like, oh, okay. He had like Volkswagen and he, he also had like canvases and stuff. Like. And we're talking about Hex, the one that had the, the battle with Slick? Yeah. Okay. So... So I can talk about that. I can let me share a little bit about the graffiti then. Like okay. for example, um, for example, uh, after they shut Radiotron down, yeah, um, I moved over to MacArthur Park Bandshell. Okay, and I hired them to the summer youth employment program. So I hired you know the graffiti artists, and I brought in a bunch of kids to do dancing on stage and uh, theater. Yeah. So I still kept my. My vision of doing a performing arts center, even though this building went down, the the vision lives on. Definitely. So I didn't let that stop me. So yeah. I'm moving across the street. There's a stage, bigger stage, yeah. going from a stage to another stage. And after that, I opened eleven other centers. Okay. Okay. And and my goal now is to open the LA Breaking Arena for the for the 28 Olympics in LA, because we don't have that. Yeah. So why don't we have that? We don't have that because in 1984, when the Olympics were here and the LA Breakers danced in the closing ceremonies of the Olympics at the LA Coliseum, yeah, which tonight is the Garfield and Roosevelt game, <laughs> game with Black Eyed Peas, yeah, <laughs> doing the halftime, right? Yeah. The Surgeon General of California declared breaking hazardous to your health. So the city wiped his hands of it. Liability. We don't. We, we don't want that. We can't support that. And to this day, is that still active? Okay. So, so, so when they when they cleared hazardous to your health, the news ca came down to the Radiotron, and they were interviewing the kids. Have you had any injuries? So little Caesar, Air Force crew, he goes, "Well, I got a ball spot on my head." So they're like, "Let me get a close up of. Can you get a close up of the ball spot?" <laughs> but then they go, "Yeah, but now we use helmets <laughs> or we put knee pads under, under a cap, homemade hats." They they found a solution. And then they interview me, and they're like, what do you think, Mr. Alvarez, about that goal? Why didn't the Surgeon General declare gangbanging hazardous to your health? Because that's what's killing our kids. Or drugs. Dancing or crack. Why didn't they declare crack, at, you know? But now that it's going to the Olympics as a dance sport, yeah. right, it's worldwide. It is breaking is having a resurgence that I've never seen before, and it is amazing. And it's not just B-boys, it's B-girls, too. Because for every B-boy, it's going to be a B-girl yeah. in the Olympics. Now, here's the sad part that I'm working on. Why don't we have a training facility here in L.A.? That's a very good Where's question. our training facility? Where yeah. is it? Who's representing L.A.? When we know that, yes, respect to the Bronx, to New York, respect, you know, to the, earth, to the pioneers of, of B-boying, much respect to them. They're, they're going to probably be the judges in the Olympics. Yeah. But we know that L.A. also was responsible for creating some of the power moves. Okay? So where is the team from L.A.? Where is the training center? The streets? They're not nobody's breakdancing in the streets, bro. They do, do that, that. No, no, no. I've, I mean, if... You, if you've seen people breakdance in the streets? I haven't. No. I have, bro. When, when I was coming up in high school, I went to a banding high school in Wilmington. Breakdancing was a thing. Shout out to my homeboy Natis and all the Dub City tribe. <clears throat> Th them guys, they were breakdancing, bro. And they would take it to the street. Mm -hmm. they were, they, I remember them carrying the little cardboard and the little yeah. boom boxes. Yeah. And this is in the 2000s, bro. Well, you know, the Unified School District also banned breaking from schools. The Unified School District, LA, they banned breaking. The city of Los Angeles banned hip hop and hard rock from any city facility. Okay. Now let's talk about graffiti. They passed so many laws against graffiti. Yeah. Okay. The city right now spends $9.5 million to remove graffiti, to buff it. 
1.5 is for a graffiti <clears throat> strike force. Okay. What the hell is a strike force? You know how much they're spending on urban art to bring the, 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 the youth in and teach them about muralism or give them opportunities to create public art? I would say zero dollars. You know how, thank you. Wow, you're the first one to guess that. <laughs> zero dollars. Wait worried. a minute. We could spend 9.5 mil, City of LA, to remove it, but we can't spend funding to create opportunities for the young people to express themselves when, just like breakdancing, graffiti is all over the world. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, shout out to um, DJ uh, Gafetto. He did a documentary about graffiti in in uh, in Central America. Okay. Called Tequilos. Tequilos is the is the Mayan word for the scribes, the ones that were tell the history, right? Like scribe on the rocks. Yes, like like the the codices, you know. Okay. So he called his documentary Tequilos. Okay, award winning documentary. Now even in Central America, in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Mexico, they're commissioning graffiti artists to do big public works. Yeah. They recognize the value of it. Here, we don't. I personally believe, bro, it's bigger than that because you got to think about it. If you start bringing positivity to the children, then you have no inmates. And by having no inmates, like guys get into trouble, probation officers don't get paid. You don't need as many police officers. And it, it could escalate to more. But that's just my personal Well, the opinion. ones that are stopping it are the anti-graffiti people. The anti-graffiti, they're, they're organized. They're the ones that they, they call the city. Uh, right now, the number one concern is homelessness. Okay. But if you go to the homeless encampments and you look at the walls, what do you see there? Graffiti. Thank you. You see? So so graffiti maybe went down to the number two concern because homelessness is the number one. But still, um, you know, kids are getting fined like $1,000 per tag. Like I know graffiti writers that have to pay a restitution of $140,000. Okay? And, and they cannot associate with their crew and they cannot vote until they pay that. Oh, so wow. they took away their voting right. They took away their right to association. And they're in debt for the rest of their life. When are they going to pay off $140,000? For graffiti. Thank you. For graffiti. It's crazy. It is. So now you know why am I an advocate? <laughs> now, <you> know, like, <laughs> we need space. Yeah. They, some people call me spaceman. Yeah. Because I've opened like 12 spaces, right? Yeah. Um, we need space for the youth. Creative space. When they go to school... The school is the space, right? But everything's like a program. Like, you know, 45 minutes, the bell rings, you go to the next one, 45 minutes, the next one, the next one. Lunch, 30 right? minutes. Right? They're like, they're like little robots, you know? Let me ask you something, brother. Now that we're talking about space. So back then when Radiotron, when you had Radiotron and the Graph Writers and Breakers at that time, it was a different time, you know? The kids had a different mentality than today. Do you think that the kids today would be okay with doing legal graffiti inside a building mm -hmm. because such of the, you got these big egos where like, oh, I'm street. I keep it in the street. Mm -hmm. Do you think those type of individuals will be willing to go into this space if you had it today? Okay, here's, here's what I would do. Okay, if I had the ability, which, I, you know, my goal is to be in a position where I could offer opportunities to the young people. Yeah. So I recognize that there's an adren adrenaline rush like doing a piece, like doing a, a, a heaven, right? Yeah, yeah. Or a corporate, you know, you're running. You're, it's, it's, it's like an adrenaline rush. So what I would do, I would create something so exciting that would make their adrenaline like whew, rise, you know? <laughs> so I would tell them this. I go, here's your choice. You could either tag and get the risk of being locked up and put it in a, in a cage, right? Yeah. Being institutionalized in a cage. Or... You can compete for a breakdance, um, for a graffiti art show in New York, and then we're going to Europe after that. So we're going to go to New York, and then we're going to go to Europe, and then we might go to Latin America, touring, yeah. doing art exhibits, doing graffiti. So you're ready for what it. What would you choose? <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm 50 years old. <laughs> Locked up in a, in a cage? Yeah. Or fly to Europe, go to New York, go to Europe, <laughs> go to Latin America, yeah. touring, traveling. What possibly, would you choose? You got, it's got to be exciting, but yeah. you can't offer them like some little, you know, corny program. That ain't going to work. I, I, I'll, I mean, I'll listen, give you free marketing as a spray can. Uh, yeah. Listen, <laughs> the thing is here, here's when they say, what's your program? I go, my program is deprogram. Yeah. My program is to deprogram them, to give them value, to know that they matter, that they have value. And a matter of fact, they're the most valuable thing. 
Like I go, I'm here for you okay. because you're the most valuable thing in the world. The youth are the light and the hope of the world. Definitely. Did you ever have a situation where you would bring in or like not bring in, but possibly find a writer in the street, a graffiti writer or something and invite him over to Radiotron or like be like, hey, man, you should go down there and check it out. Did, were you ever put in that position? Uh, one time I was driving down Venice Boulevard. Yeah. And I saw a little kid, 12 year old little kid busting a Scooby Doo on the side of the alley. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, man, it is amazing. So I pull, I, I, I pull back. The kid packed his spray cans in his backpack yeah. and he's running down the alley and I'm driving <laughs> right next to him. And I'm like, I like your work. Yeah. And then he stopped and he goes, oh, I thought you were a cop. I go, no, no, no. I'm Carmelo. I go, I have a center down the street. It's Radiotron. It's by MacArthur Park. And yeah. I gave him a flyer. And he goes, oh, yeah, I heard about it. I've been meaning to go there. Yeah. That was Prime. Prime K2S. Prime K2S. Oh, wow. Okay. And now Prime... I just came from, he just did a show in Chinatown yeah. with Craze and Defer and, and, and Retina yeah. and Prime. And, and Prime was chosen to do the cover for the Getty Black Book of the top 150 graffiti artists in LA. And Prime got chosen to do the cover. Oh, wow. The cover. Prime, Prime's been in museums, galleries, exhibit. <laughs> he, sold, he sells work. I mean, Prime. Yeah. Little 12-year-old kid from the hood doing a Scooby-Doo on the side. Of an alley to go into the Getty Museum. Thank you. Yes, that, that's a, okay. That, that's a big accomplishment. And then my other my other one is uh, create create. That's another another kid. So in the nineties, I was working for Conservation Corps. Yeah. And I hired graffiti writers, uh, Two Tone, Zender, Create, and I had them reading the newspaper in the morning. Yeah. And then come up with uh, with an idea to do a graffiti art piece. Yeah. Then I showed them how to get permission how to get release forms to go and talk to the business owners and get the permission to do a mural. Yeah. You know, le legit wise. But that get into any problem. Right. And, uh, and one of the murals was a, a, a hand coming out of a, a pie. It's yeah. called a piece of pie. Yeah. And it had a slice like, like, like brown thin and then black thin and then yellow thin. And then the, the rest of it was white <laughs> <laughs> it was called a piece of pie. Piece yeah. Of, so the LA Times did an article about it, and they said that the kids were biting the hand that feeds them. That's what they said about the yeah. mirror. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. wow! But the, but the piece was done by by a by two tone. Yeah. And she's she's two tone because she has one brown eye and one green eye. Oh, this is a female. Yeah, female. Oh wow! And she's she's I don't know, she's both. She's. One of her parents is black, one of her parents is white. Yeah. <laughs> She's two tone, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's what she gets her name from. Two yeah. Tone. Okay. And, and and she busted that piece. Yeah. So if it's political, if it's commentary, they don't like that. What do they want the kids to do? Kill each other, beat each other up. There you go. There you go. <laughs> no, but I'm not with that. So you know, we could talk, we know the problems and we know all that. So I I don't focus on that. I focus on the solutions. Yeah. We could talk all day, complain about the problem. But let's spend time talking about the solution and let's make that happen. Definitely. Let's make it happen. You know, we can make it happen. Would you say, bro, that Radio Tron was a big part in West Coast hip hop and graffiti? I would, I would say that it, it played a role. It was a part because of the fact of having a space where you can go in, in there and I didn't have like a schedule. Okay. In other words, like if you wanted to DJ, you could DJ 50 minutes, sign up, you know, get on the turntables. You know, we had headphone sets. You can do your own thing. Uh, if you wanted to go pop, animation was there teaching kids how to pop. We had Ozrock and others, Oracle, that were teaching breakdancing or practice. You could go upstairs to the graffiti room. Like, hey, guys, there's going to be a kid coming in. Take care of them. Okay. Like, don't be, like, trying to act like, oh, get out of here. This is not no, 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 no. Yeah. So you can go from one place to another but what if you didn't feel good that day? What if you just want to chill in the lobby? That's mm. okay too. I might see you sitting in the lobby. Hey, what's up? How's it going? Maybe you guys, maybe you need someone to talk to. Talk what if to you just want to socialize? What if you, what, where's the dance? So we can, we have dance, right? Yeah. People want to dance. Where do you go? Like where do kids go to dance now? They shut down the tea clubs. Yeah. You got to be 21 and over because it's all about the booze. Yeah, there, there's a place called the uh, I won't say the name, but there's a place in, in the down here in the, the art district and even downtown LA. They're all bars. 
They're all 20. My, I got a 19-year-old. My 19-year-old son. Yeah. I try to take him to places and they, he can't get in. Because it's all about making money from the booze. Yeah. Where do the teenagers go? So you know where they go? They go underground. They go to abandoned house. They go to some parents aren't home. Yeah. And you know what they do? What they're not supposed to do. Definitely. But when you create a space and they're, and they're under adult supervision, now the adults got to be cool though. Yeah, yeah. You know, they got to be hip. They can't be like, <laughs> you know, you got to recognize that they're, responsible. Going, that they're going through whatever puberty and hormonal changes and they're going to be acting a certain way. Yeah. And they're going to be dancing a certain way. Well, there's reggaeton. Back then it was the freak. The animation freak. led the freak train. Yeah, freak. <laughs> animation was the teacher? <laughs> yeah. They did the freak, you know. They were freak dancing, right? Can freak. you talk a little bit about animation? Yes. Oh, my God. Like, oh, it's like, it's, it's emotional. It's emotional, you know? Yeah. Um, animation came in there one day. Um, I have videos of animation. Uh, Do-rag, Fedora. Three belts, <laughs> <laughs> MC Hammer pants, <laughs> big boombox walking yeah. down Seventh Street, you yeah. know. So animation was um was scrappy, scrappy do, you know, okay. from from the neighborhood. But he had a gift, and you know what his gift was dancing and making people laugh. He was like a, a comedy hopper, right? Hopper okay. dancer. I call him an entertainer. Like when noises. He's like, an entertainer, man. Right? He, he, he ever had the noises where it was like. Pshh. He, he made all his own sound. He made all his special effects. He made all his tapes. He rapped. He rapped. He danced. He did comedy. Yeah. So he came in there, 17 years old. And uh, I went and got permission from his mom. His mom was at a church in South, on Central Avenue, you know. And he lived there. He lived in Radio Trump for two years. He, he taught the kids. I mean, he was an amazing entertainer. Um, I told him about a stand-up com comedic that I... Comedy, comedian, a stand-up comedian that I saw in Greenwich Village in New York. Yeah. And and he made money, like, just off of standing there and doing comedy. But he made fun of every ethnic group. <laughs> so animation put a little routine together where he, he was showing, like, how white people dance. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how, how Mexicans dance. Yeah, yeah. And how Asians dance. And how black people dance. You know, and he had everybody rolling. he bring people from the audience up. I mean, the man was um, an entertainer, one of the top street entertainers in the world. And I'm just glad I talked to him, you know, before he passed away. And I got to tell him. Rest in we peace. Got, we, we, got, we got, you know, we were planning to do great things. We were planning to do a movie. And I'm glad I told him I love him. Tell people you love him. Because you never know. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's to... okay. <laughs> Say it. Yeah. Say it, you know, because you never know. That might be the last time you see them. I mean, I've been in situations that that was like the last word, and it's like, that's it. Yeah. It's and crazy. start with your kids. Start with your mama. Go tell your mom, mom, I love you. Love you, mom. Yeah. Love you, dad. Start with your start with your family. Definitely. And if you have kids, start with your kids. Tell them you, you love them. Got to, man, because you never know what could happen, brother. I mean, they, everybody needs that. A lot of kids don't get that. So we need to create spaces that are loving and nurturing and that we appreciate their talent and their gifts. And it's a space where they can go there and develop that. Yeah. And be appreciated. And you want to see all this. What, what motivated those girls? What motivated these girls about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, eight o'clock in the morning, they're, they're going and buying a, a fentanyl, like at school. Eight o'clock in the morning, they're going and buying fentanyl. By the end of the day, one of them's passed away. The other one's in the hospital. I feel it's social what, media, what, But Wait a minute. What can more, what, what is it? Is school, is school that boring? I mean, you know, the, what? The, the lack of knowledge, social media, trying to follow trends. TikTok. I mean, I, I, I take responsibility that we're not doing enough. You know, we got to modernize the school education system. The kids are so advanced now. They have, this is the age of information. Yeah, we they, can't. We gotta change the way of of that we're doing the education. All they system. gotta do is hop on the internet. And they'll be able to find out anything anywhere, anytime. So some some of the kids are so smart and beyond that that the schools aren't keeping up. <laughs> they're not keeping up with the pace. <laughs> yeah. So you gotta, gotta make up. yeah. You gotta make schools that that you know find the gift of each individual person and help them develop that gift that they're born with, and then help them find their purpose in life. See, because when you align your purpose. And your gifts 
Yeah. That is the key that opens the doors to possibilities. And possibilities take you a long way. <laughs> the kids got to see, the kids have to see the possibilities that they have in their life. And if they don't see a future and they don't see that and they don't value themselves, they're going to be destructive to themselves and to each other. So we can't tell them, oh, the kids aren't respecting the walls. How do you show respect to a kid? You got to teach him respect by giving him respect, giving him or her respect, yeah. giving them respect. And you know how you respect them? By creating space for them, by nurturing their talents, not by always passing laws against them, incarcerating them, criminalizing them, putting them down, telling them they're not worthy. That's not showing them respect. Then no wonder they're going to go in and tag up all the walls. And now that we touch on this subject, brother, let me ask you something. At Radio Tron, did you ever have an issue with the barrios? I mean, like them not being happy with what you got going on or trying to intimidate the children that might just want to hang out there instead of being in the neighborhood? No, because a lot of the a lot of the el el elders, a lot of the, you know, the metal metals. Yeah. Like they'll bring their kids to me. Okay. <laughs> you know, especially when once I got hip to the summer youth employment. Yeah. When I was when I was in 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 uh, a teenager, I got a job in the summer youth employment program, and they sent me to to a school. And the guy told me, "Just sit down. You you want some ice cream?" and and had me sitting there doing nothing. And I left because it was boring. Yeah. Boredom is a big thing for the young people. They got so much energy, bro. You got to keep them moving, man. Yeah, definitely. Follow them. <laughs> <laughs> Follow them. Ask them what they think. Yeah. Because you'd be surprised. They have solutions. But yeah. we're gonna, you know, they'll, they'll tell you what they think you want to hear. They're smart. Yeah. See, they'll tell you what they think you want to hear. Yeah, yeah. I go up to a kid, hey, are you a writer? And they go, no. What is that? <laughs> yeah, and I see that I look at their book, it's all taped. <laughs> I go, did you write that? That's pretty good, man. <laughs> and they go, why? And then I show them pictures of guys that I know. Oh, yeah. I know this guy. <laughs> I know that guy. And they go, you know that guy? I go, yeah. No way. No way. <laughs> you know, so then they open up to me. Yeah. I go, that's pretty good. You got good style. Now that we speak about that too, brother, can you share a little bit about the picture that, that I showed you with the Geobot and... Uh, does, I think it's Zen piece and the other piece I was yeah. there. Can you share a little bit about how that came about yeah. and stuff? So that's another, see, okay, so, <clears throat> okay, here it is, man. When you do, uh, when you're a youth advocate yeah, and you do um, youth work, right? Um, there's a thing called um, compassion fatigue yeah, or secondary trauma because you have to be careful not to absorb, like, all the problems and issues that the young people are going through. But you still have to be aware of them and compassionate. Uh, Gio was a joy. Gio was a popper. Okay. In fact, Gio was like, <laughs> you, like your, you, it was your type. Yeah. Like you're more or less your size, like, like you. Yeah. You remind me of Gio, in fact, a lot. <laughs> you do. Like, same laugh. And can you pop? You pop? No? I can you try. Know, bit? <laughs> yeah, there it is. That's G. Okay. So Gio would come and entertain and laugh and popping. He'd be popping, you know, and he was also a graffiti artist. Yeah. Um, just a joy to be around. So when when he was when he was shot and killed, it was very tragic, you know. And the kids wanted to do a, a memorial you know, a, piece. A piece, a memorial piece for him. So they did that memorial piece. In the parking lot of Radiotron. Okay. See, one of the things about having a building, and you're in California, Southern California, especially Los Angeles, it could be a rundown, dilapidated building like the Radiotron, but it had a big parking lot. Yeah. If people want to know where can I park, you know? Mm -hmm. So the parking lot was pivotal also in, in that building, and, and it had a wall. Yeah. So they did the, they did that that memorial for Geo on Rest that wall. Rest in peace, Geo. Mm -hmm, on that wall. And... Um, and that's all I can say about it. It was a tragic thing. We lost, we lost a lot of kids. You know. Yeah. We lost a lot of kids. What I say, if they would have been there, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I thank God that we never had a drive-by there. We never had a fight in there. Okay. And we never had that. We never had no, anybody OD there. It never went. It never happened in in the two years that that we were there that we yeah. were open. And I'm very grateful and thankful for that. And these two years were from 1983 to 80, uh, like 86, like early 86. You know? Okay. I got two questions for you, brother, before we get out of here. How did the kids take it, the, mainly the graffiti writers, when it, when they was like, all right, Radiotron's over. You can't come here no more. 
you know, not only the not only the writers, but many of them, they return to the streets. Okay. And and a lot of them, again, sad to say, uh, they they got shot. A lot of them, they have the the the, the scars to prove that yeah. they lived, but they 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 got shot. You know, and some of them are not with us anymore when they went back on the street. Because remember, this was by 86, you had the, the crack cocaine yeah. was rampant in our communities. And then all of a sudden you have the Uzis. Wait yeah. a minute, how AK-47 and Uzis? Where did the kids get Uzis? How, how are Uzis and crack cocaine coming to our community? The kids don't have airplanes. The kids don't have money to go import stuff. Yeah. How does how did that happen? But they ban they banned hip hop. See, they the <laughs> Surgeon General said break, breaking is hazardous. The oozes and crack. But cocaine. they're bringing <laughs> crack in, and we know what's behind it because it took years later to discover that the, the government was complicit in that. Yeah. And then the other thing was the police brutality. So then you have the Rampart scandal, mm -hmm. which went to court and they lost. The, 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 the LAPD was under a federal like uh, oversight because they found them planting drugs in the, on, on suspects, you know? Yeah. Which all led to the Ronnie King trial, which led to the LA uprising. Okay. I saw it coming. It, it, it was so obvious to me. Now, at the same time, the schools are being defunded. So you have overcrowded schools, and you have crack, you have Uzis, gang banging, battle rams, all that happening. But none of it's none of it's bad for you, but breaking this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this but but the... they but they want to ban brand break dancing. That's you know? crazy. So so I saw I saw it coming, and I called it. You know I called it, and then they were asking me, "How did you know it was going to happen?" Because I'm working with the youth. I'm in the community. Like, get out of your office. Spend time in the neighborhood. Yeah. Go and see. Walk it. You know, go there. Talk to the people. Talk to the youth. And what would you tell that kid today, brother, that wants to start breakdancing, DJing, or even painting graffiti, and wants to pursue that lifestyle? What would you say to him? I would say to do it. I would say definitely do it. Uh, if you're going to be a break dancer, you know what? Warm up first. <laughs> warm up. You don't want to get hurt. Yeah. You know, warm up. Put a, a knee pad under your cap when you do the head spin so you don't get a ball spot on your head. But I would say warm up and do it because it's coming to the Olympics in 24 in Paris, France. They're going to have the tryouts. But get ready for 28 back in L.A. You have a chance. And even if you, it, it's not even about the Olympics. It's just something that's healthy and beautiful to do. Yeah, it's a, it's about the culture, man, about the best of our people. Mm -hmm. uh, graffiti, I think now it's considered an art form. Um, you For know, what? Most get, part, get, yeah. get, go to a backyard, go buy some canvas. There's in Almani, there's a canvas factory. In El Monte, like, uh huh, a canvas factory. Google El Monte canvas for hundred bucks. You get yourself a big roll and hang it up in your backyard and go on piece and wear a mask. Yeah. Wear a mask because you want to breathe that. Mm -hmm. So that's you, what I would suggest. You don't want to get out high and be mm -hmm. like, ooh. -hoo. And if you're an MC and you're a rapper, you're a DJ, you know what? Rap about something that's going to uplift our people. So that's what I got advice to give. Warm up, wear a mask, and rap about something that's going to uplift our people. <laughs> okay. Hey, brother, again. <laughs> I wanna Is that thank, okay? <laughs> I want to thank you, brother, for you know stopping by. And giving a top of the day to speak to you today. I mean, Radio Tron is a historical place for LA graffiti writers, break dancers, and DJs. And man, I hope to see it come back again. It will. Anybody out there checking in, make sure to like and subscribe. Check the Patreon. Again, I want to give a shout out to my first sponsor, May Fresh <laughs> Graffiti Shop. Make sure to check them out on Instagram. It's all love. I'm out. 